Hello everybody, good evening and you're very welcome to our webinar for History Teachers, which is focusing on historical skills for research and assessment. Hope you're keeping well. My name is Connor Walker. I'm the head of post primary publishing. With Follins Publishers. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, we really do appreciate it. And very shortly, I'm going to pass you on to our authors and presenters, Andrew, Mark and Marie Claire. Um, so that will be very soon. But before I hand you over to them, I just want to run through a couple of things, a few bits of housekeeping. Um, so firstly, um, if there's anything that you like or if you've got any curiosity about the legacy, our excellent legacy publication, you can find out more about it on folands.ie. So just go to folands.ie and if you visit that site, you can see examples of our textbook, of the skills book and the teacher's guide. And there's a range of digital resources that you can also see um, for that. And also, if you'd like to take it to the next stage and have a conversation with our rep, they're available for calls or appointments at any time that suits you. They can arrange samples for you and they can support book rentals if you need to discuss that. So you go on to folands.ie, run a search by plugging in your role number or your school name, and that will return the rep's information and their contact details. So before I hand you over to the guys, actually another thing I wanted to mention is that during the course of the presentation, you've got the option to post comments if you'd like to. So there's two ways that you can do that. The first way is by doing it through the Q&A section. And if you click that button at the top of your screen, you can post a question to us and we'll answer it that way. Or another mode of pointing or asking a question is by going through the comments button. So if you click the comments button and enter your question that way, we'll catch the question that, um, that way as well. And we'll get through as many questions as we can at the end of the presentation. Next, I would like to then introduce you to our authors. Um, to begin with, we've got Andrew McEnry, he'll be starting, and he teaches at Colossia Isagon in Stillorgan in Dublin. He's on the National Committee for the HTAI and has presented many workshops on methodologies and approaches to classroom-based assessment. Then after Andrew, Marie Claire will present. Marie Claire Chewitt is a history teacher and assistant principal at Muckross Park College in Dublin. She's the Vice President of the History Teachers Association as well. Then finally, Mark Power will be presenting. He teaches at Abbey Community College in Waterford. In a previous life, he was a journalist who worked for WLR FM in Waterford and received several nominations for PPI awards during the course of his career there, working particularly on news and history documentaries. Mark's also a member of the Southeast branch of the HTAI. So I'd like to welcome all three of you today. I'm really looking forward to the presentation. I'll hand it over to you, Andrew, if you want to take control now, and I wish you the best of luck. Thank you uh, very much, Connor. I'll just get my presentation up here. So folks, uh, thanks a million for joining us today. Um, myself and Mark and Mary Claire are just going to, I suppose, give you a couple of tips um, and I suppose things that you can use uh, in your own classrooms, uh, particularly approaching, I suppose, the end of the year and approaching the, the final exam in third year. We were delighted um, when we saw the uh, exam come out last year that it very much aligned with uh, the, I suppose, the goals of Legacy. Legacy was written um, following the publication of the State Examination Commission and the, and the NCCA uh, sample papers. So, you know, they very much shaped uh, our approach in terms of the questions and the design of uh, assessment in the book. So we were, we were very relieved and happy to see that. So we're going to I suppose, talk through uh, some tips in relation to preparing for exam and I suppose preparing students for research and um, looking at areas for future assessment. So I'm going to take us through the first two points here. The importance of working with sources, which underpins, I suppose, the whole principle of our, our legacy package and um, a couple of tips in terms of writing accounts, as they are, of course, the primary uh, focal point for, for marks when it comes to the exam uh, in June. 
Okay, um, so as you of course will know, the 2022 exam was made up and it was no surprise, I suppose, to us or to, to any teachers, really. It was mostly made up of source questions, that is evidence based questions. Five of the eight questions on the exam were were evidence source questions. And even the ones that weren't, there was another two questions. They weren't necessarily source questions, but they were questions that were still structured in a similar way and invited students to read um, grids and, you know, match terms and things. So there's always uh, an important, there's also, there's always always a, a strong element of looking at sources and reading, reading data, re reading evidence and answering questions on that. Um, we were, we, as I said, we, we wrote legacy following the publication of the, the State Examinations Commission sample paper. So, you know, in the textbook itself, you have uh, source questions, evidence questions almost on every page, every every couple of pages uh, to make sure that students are getting used to the language that can, some of the challenging language uh, that can be uh, seen in some of those sources. Um, and, and we saw that as well in, in the 22 uh, exam paper. And then of course our skills book, uh, which is very much shaped along those lines as well. Uh, you have a source and evidence questions and then the kind of a grade eight, a kind of graded uh, categories of question, then fairly straightforward questions, slightly more challenging questions, and then kind of account style questions connected to sources. So every single, almost every single question uh, in our skills book is based in that way. And Marie Claire uh, will be talking in more detail about that. She was uh, insistent when we were writing the book and uh, I'm very glad she was that, uh, you know, the skills book questions would, would even look like the state examinations questions uh, you know, similar font, similar uh, boxes and space, getting students used to uh, writing in the amount of space provided, those kinds of things. Um, when it comes to helping your own students, uh, something that I do now and something that uh, we incorporated into Legacy was to kind of introduce students to the, the three types of questions that go along with these sources and these evidence questions. OK, so you can break it down into effectively three types, you know, very straightforward category one questions. These are the short answer questions. You can see there at the top of the screen um, examples from the 2022 exam paper. You know, the first question there, it's an archaeological uh, question. And then the very the kind of the category one question, as I say, is that very straightforward information retrieval question. You know, where in Ireland is Dune Point located? All they have to do is they look at the source and they, the information is right there for them. Um, we we of course uh, have have plenty of those types of you know straightforward information retrieval questions connected to sources and evidence questions. A couple of tips for your students: make sure they read all the information very carefully, including the introductory lines. You know, as you see there at the top of the page, uh, you can see the introductory material on top of the photograph, on top of the source on question one of the 2022 exam paper. It said an archaeological dig took place at Dune Point in County Kerry, May to June 2021. Use the photograph and report below to answer the questions. Sometimes students, they can kind of just look at the photo and then just look at the questions. They don't read all of the introductory material. But of course, there is actually, you know, that introductory material is very important um, and it is, is actually, you know, often some of the questions are actually based on that. So it's important you get your students used to that. I'd be telling my students not to waste time on these. A one word answer is fine. You know, just write the numbers. If it's, if it's the year, just write the write the year, you know, 1944, whatever it might be. And uh, you don't need to write full long sentences. You should save that energy, save that effort for the, for the more intense uh, kind of account style questions that come uh, later on. For the second the category two type question, as I call them, um, that they need to pay a little bit more attention to and can be a little trickier. These category two type questions, as we saw in the summer uh, exam, or as, as we saw in the junior cycle exam, I should say, in 2022, um, they basically can invite the student to, to kind of talk about connected knowledge. So it might not necessarily be information that's in the photo, in the document, in uh, the, the journal entry or whatever it might be, whatever the source is. Uh, it's kind of connecting their knowledge, testing their knowledge on the topic that it's related to. Similarly, these types of questions can also invite students to talk about, you know, the source itself, interrogate the source, you know, look for examples of bias, um, suggest where you might find uh, similar sources, identify the source as being a primary source or secondary source, all those types of questions. They're kind of mid-level questions, they're challenging um, and students have to 
take care with them. And um, of course, we have plenty of these in legacy as we, as, as every uh, legacy source question is structured in the same way as the state exam, and commission exam, you know, with those category one, information retrieval, category two, connected knowledge and source evaluation questions or kind of interrogating the source style questions. You can see an example there on the right hand side of your page from, from our skills book relating to, uh, to the, the 1960s. OK, a um, couple of tips when it comes to these types of questions is to really take care when you when you when you read the question and you can see there on the right hand side of the screen you can see um, a screenshot from the marking scheme for the 2022 paper Here you can see the question at the top it said explain three features of renaissance art using examples from the second painting and a lot of students might have missed out um, on you know the, the the key nuance of that question, they needed to make reference to the second painting, not the first. So some students might have made reference to the first, and of course, then got no marks for for, for doing that. And um, they need to identify the feature and then explain how that feature is in the second painting. And you can see there's quite a few marks when you start stacking up all of those different things that they have to do. Um, you know, it comes to quite a few marks, a 15 mark answer there for what sounds like a, a fairly short question. So, um, you know, candidates should be careful. And we saw that in the chief examiner's uh, kind of report that came out there just yesterday um, with tips for students going into next year's exam or now this summer's exam, that candidates should read every question carefully and answer exactly what is asked. It's good practice to underline the keywords in a question. And that scaffolding and that advice is something that we incorporated uh, into legacy as well. So, you know, make sure you keep your answers short and to the point. Again, these aren't, you know, full essays. These aren't long accounts, these questions. So keep your answers short and to the point. You don't need to, um, you know, you don't need to be, have very, very wordy answers. You know, there's no background or anything like that. And, um, you know, it's not a full account. So just keep it clear and just answer the question that's that's being asked. OK. Just it's also important that you get your students used to the source type questions like, you know, why would a source like this be useful to a historian? What are the advantages or the disadvantages of this source? Is there reliability in the source? Is it a primary source, secondary source? Is there bias? You know, what other source might you use to, to study the same topic? Where can you find this type of source? Is it in an archive? Would you find it in a library? Would you find it in a museum? OK, the final then category of question that you get in these source type questions is the longer account style question. And you have examples on the screen there from ones from 2022. Write a short account of the Civil War and um, write an account of one of the developments um, that impacted on uh, the, um, the, the new world in the age of conquest and exploration. And then you can see there on the right um, an account of a, a revolution from uh, pre 20th century Europe. Um, so the causes or consequences of the revolution. These questions, obviously, uh, you're going to have to get your students very much used to and prepared for. There's quite a lot involved in the accounts. And obviously these uh, these accounts questions are the, the most heavily weighted question in terms of the marks. OK, they all seemed to be worth 18 marks um, in last summer's exam. That being said, you know, they may be worth slightly less or they may be worth more in, in this summer's exam. They will, you know, they might they might very well change parts of the exam or they might change the the, the weighting of marks in the exam, depending on, on uh, how students do and whatnot. So we, we can't be guaranteed that it's going to be 18 marks, you know, so uh, but it, it's going to be significant anyway. Uh, obviously, we have plenty of these types of questions, these kind of longer account style questions, both in the textbook and in the skills book of legacy. And, you know, we incorporated them according to the learning outcomes. And that's the key tip when it comes to these accounts. OK, it's that you and your students are familiar with the learning outcomes because the account style questions will uh, necessarily be shaped by the learning outcome. So if you think about a learning outcome like, you know, the causes, uh, course and consequences of, uh, of, of a pre 20th century revolution in Ireland, um, you know, that is what the account style question is going to be. It's going to ask students to write an account of the causes and or consequences of the 1798 rebellion. Um, so familiarizing yourselves with the, the learning outcomes is very, very important. And those, you know, the, the, the longer account style questions that we wrote into Legacy are all kind of shaped by those learning outcomes in the same way. So they're kind of similar ones that you might expect to see in, in the summer. So know those key areas. Look at the learning outcomes would be the, the, the major tip. They'll definitely, all of these account questions will definitely be shaped by, by the learning outcomes wording. OK, um, you know, again, like the causes, course and consequences of the Second World War, for example. 
Um, a little tip for you uh, if you're looking for ideas is to look at the old junior cert exam, uh, the past papers on examinations.ie, and you can actually see that the old question five, which would have been a kind of document style question, the last of the document style questions, the 5C question, is very similar to, these, th to this style of account question. OK, now, obviously, some of them are going to be relevant. Some of them won't be relevant. They're obviously they're parts of the old junior cycle course, which are no longer on our course. And of course, we have new uh, elements of learning outcomes in our spe new specification. So, you know, there that obviously bit of that little tip comes with a caveat, you know, to, to use your own discretion as a teacher. You, you should obviously know, um, you know, that that um, you know, some parts are going to be irrelevant or whatnot now. Um, and the important thing here is that students stick to the question, you know, students stick to the question. So if it's inviting uh, a student to write about, you know, an account of the Civil War, for example, that was one of the uh, questions on the 2022 exam that, you know, they they really only stick to writing an account of the Civil War. They don't spend too much time on background like the uh, the War of Independence, for example, um, that that, you know, you, there are some marks for, for backgrounds if it's relevant, uh, but but generally no more than six marks, so no more than two points. So it's important that you don't spend too much time uh, on, on anything that's irrelevant. Stick to the question, stick to what's being being asked is, a, is an important tip. You know, some of you might be thinking, how much should they, how much should they write? It's something my students are definitely asking, you know, how much should we, should we should we write? And it is difficult to answer that question. Ultimately, you should try and fill the space that's provided. And this is a tip that that was given by the, uh, the by the examiner again um, in their advice that came out yesterday that, you know, the students will should be able to do well and should be able to attain full marks using the space provided on the exam. So that's one thing. The other thing, I suppose, as a rule of thumb, I'm certainly now telling my students to try and make six developed points in an account. So, you know, make a point, use an example, um, you know, use an individual's name to develop the point, you know, a, a relevant historical fact, try and uh, provide a, a, a relevant to the question uh, developed uh, fact. And that should should get you three points. And if you include six of them, that'll be 18 marks. OK, and that'll be full marks. There is more examples of, of those types of question. Again, a lot of them shaped by the, the learning outcomes. And just on the right there, you can see the chief examiner's uh, advice, which came out yesterday. Candidates should be familiar with the language of the learning outcomes and know what is meant if a question asks about a pattern of settlement, for example, or the parliamentary tradition, because those are the terms that are in the learning outcomes. And again, just as I said, the uh, the accounts are always going to be shaped by uh, the, the, the specifics of the learning outcomes in the specification. OK. When it comes to writing accounts, then um, I've probably given the majority of the tips there, but, you know, it's important that that you should, you know, scaffold your students um, and and, you know, get them used to planning out uh, accounts and writing accounts in a kind of structured way. And we do plenty of that in our in our uh, legacy skills book, as you can see there on the right with little suggestions um, on how they can you know maximize their points in, in, in accounts. Um, you know, one one little uh, tip as well is you know not to spend too much time on a conclusion. You know, there aren't, so far as we can see anyway, based on last year's exam, there are no marks going necessarily for conclusion or summarizing everything you've said or anything like that. It's not an English exam, and um, they they've kind of removed that very intense um, uh, kind of almost English style, ex uh, you know, assessment of your style of writing is is no longer there in the marks. So so you know save your time, save your energy, don't don't bother with it. Um, with that, I uh, I kind of come to a close on my section of the um, of the presentation. Um, just a little tip again is to, you know, uh, the, as you can see on your screen there, uh, the end of every single chapter in Legacy uh, has key points for revision. These are actually very useful for writing accounts as well. You know, these are actually quite useful for the, the weaker students as well, because it kind of is a, is a bare bones summarize, summarizing of the, the chapter. But the way we structured our uh, summary points at the end of each of our chapters was, again, shaped according to the learning outcome. So the learning outcome uh, for for the 1916 War of Independence Civil War era focuses on causes, course and consequences. So we've broken down all of our uh, points into causes, course and consequences. That's kind of a little revision aid for the students at the end of, of each, of our, each of our chapters and should help them again in, in structuring um, these accounts, which of course are shaped by, by the learning outcomes. So I'll pass on now to um, uh, 
to uh, Marie Claire, who's going to talk about um, uh, skills and research skills. Thank you, Andrew. And um, hopefully everyone can hear me all right. Can they, Andrew? I can indeed. So right. I think everyone okay. should be able to. <laughs> I just wanted to double check that. Um, OK, well, I suppose the purpose of my section here is to talk about how to scaffold uh, the learning when it comes to skills development, because this is really challenging. Students find analysing primary sources quite challenging, and it is something that is challenging for them. So from our perspective, when we were designing our, our uh, skills book, we thought about how to make that easier, first of all, for the students, but second of all, for you, the teacher. And so this is the section really that determines um, this part of the course, and that is the working with evidence section from strand one. It talks about investigating the job of the historian, you know, how they find and use evidence, debating the usefulness of different types of sources. And that includes, you know, a variety of primary and secondary sources, along with archaeology and new technology. And um, then we're talking about developing historical judgment based on evidence. That is quite a challenging one for them. Uh, the last one, investigating a repository. I was quite daunted when I saw this because I thought, oh my God, another school trip I have to organise. But actually, we're in a very privileged position these days with the quantity of things that are online. So we've designed quite a few activities in the skills book around investigating repositories online, which is just as relevant as, as going to a local library. And um, <clears throat> so these are from last year's uh, exam paper, the type of questions that we're talking about here when we say debate the usefulness and limitation of different types of sources. So you can see there, uh, on the left hand side is source to a primary source or a secondary. Give a reason for your answer. So they would have had to have probably accessed or seen one of those sources before to be able to answer that. And then, you know, positives and negatives of this. So they have to actually process the source and determine that. Finally, what evidence about the Holocaust is provided by three different types of sources? They will have to put on their historical hat and think, well, the Holocaust is, you know, 1940s. What sources were available then? And um, what? How could I, as a historian, prove this? So, you know, that's a challenging question itself. And um, this one, at uh, 1.8, uh, a repository of historical evidence. There was uh, two types of, of questions on this on last year's paper. You can see there uh, what are two different two differences between an archive and a library. Students found that question really challenging. And when myself and a couple of history teachers discussed it, you know, there's only a few things they could actually say. So they really have to have explored archives and libraries to be able to articulate that. You see then on the right hand side, Cavan County Museum. Um, you know, you've to analyse this advertisement for it. So, you know, even having explored an online uh, website for a museum will have been a benefit to them. And so when we were designing the skills book, we, we thought about this. How are we going to scaffold all of these different skills that they have to learn in an age appropriate way? And so with first years, we decided that, you know, one of the things that will be really beneficial is, first of all, to find their local repository. And this is where we start. We use the language. From the outset, OK, so that they know, you know, a repository can be. Well, here's the term explained for them. And so um, we bring them to a website where they can access and find their local repository and they just answer some questions on that. So immediately they can relate this concept to something practical and local in their area. And. Um, just to explain. All of these that I'm suggesting to you now come under the research and reflect section at the end of each chapter in the skills book. And we called it research and reflect. And um, so that they know that they're actually engaging in research and then they're thinking about what they're doing. And um, the next activity that I thought would be of use for them is to go to a World Heritage site, go to uh, a, a place of historical importance, but they're doing it virtually and they really enjoy doing this activity. So. From the outset, from the second topic they've covered in first year, they've already visited one of these, you know, really important historical sites and they're able to talk about how technology helped them do that. And that is one of the explanations. That's one of the specific parts of the learning outcome in uh, in working with evidence. Then we move on to actually practical, tangible sources. And with first years, we don't want it to be overly taxing. So they're going to learn to analyse a picture. What questions do they need to ask? How how would they interpret the information from this picture? And that is designed with a series of questions. 
very simple series of questions that they can apply to any picture that they see in front of them. So that is training them from the outset. Um, next, we thought with the Renaissance, it would actually be really interesting for them to try and curate their own exhibit. And so you're introducing the language there again, curate. What does that mean? Um, and so they are taking the pictures that they've perhaps been practicing analyzing now since they learned that skill with the Middle Ages and they're going to design an exhibition. This is great practice for potentially the CBA in second year. It's it's a very, you know, hands on, easy thing for them to do. They can do it virtually, they can do it on a um, platform or they can do it, you know, on a piece of paper. It doesn't have to be too taxing, a challenging activity, but they have curated an exhibit. So when they come across that, they know what things need to go into an exhibition. Then moving on to the next topic, you know, we're moving on to slightly more meatier uh, topics in terms of research, and that is um, the explorations. And so we thought, you know, this is where we should teach them how to start doing some research. And so this idea of scoping. Well, when you sit down to plan to do research, what questions should you think of? So they're not actually going to do the research. They're just thinking about doing the research. If I were to research this, what would I need to find out? And so they're practicing that skill set on a very interesting topic, but they don't actually have to go and do the research then. OK, none of these tasks are designed to put extra work on you, the teacher. There's very little correction. It could be peer correction, you know, and um, it's actually just practical hands on skills. Uh, the next activity then, because the way we designed the the I suppose the scheme of work for this is that they would finish first year by covering the Reformation. And so actually we thought, well, let's get them to do a bit of writing. You know, this could be incorporated if you want to as their end of term assessment. But we have scaffolded a learning activity uh, using both the skills book and it, it's outlined in the teacher book, how to get them to write an obituary. And so that is writing an account of someone's life. And it, we talk about obituaries because they're actually a very useful secondary source. And so they're coming up with this idea that actually, if I wanted to find out about someone, I could read their obituary to get an overview of their life. And so you're introducing this, um, I suppose, other perspective on sources of information. Where do historians get their information from? So that's the, the I suppose, the first year skills that we're, we're training them in. And we're going to build on that for next year. Just to put in here, this is part of the advice handed out yesterday by the uh, junior cycle examination information note. Um, and it said candidates should engage with visual sources and they specifically stated drawings, photographs, maps and cartoons. And um, students should practice describing what they see before moving on to higher order tasks such as identifying point of view or interpreting a message from an illustration. And I, I wanted to put this in here because this is exactly what we had planned when we were designing the next section to show you. And um, and that is the second year sources. So, um, you know, we wanted to make the sources age appropriate and easy for them to access. And by the time they're in second year, you know, maps are, are, are more challenging to analyze than, than a painting. Cartoons are more challenging to analyze than a painting. So the same skill set that they used on the painting back in first year, they're now developing in second year with the maps and with the cartoons. So you can see here I've put in two of the sections from the skills book. Um, I was thrilled that we got permission to use uh, the maps that, that are in this skills book there in Ulster University and hardly anyone has seen them. So the fact that they gave us permission to use them, Richard Bartlett designed uh, and, and drew them back during the uh, Ulster plantation. So the students get to practice researching uh, and analysing maps using these really excellent primary sources. But it also explains to them at the start, well, what sort of things are we looking for in a map? What might a map tell us about the past that we don't know now? Um, and it also uh, introduces some of those key terms, surveyor, draftsman, cartographer, because they will come across these terms as they progress in, 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 in the history course. And it's important that as we go along, it's making meaning for them. Uh, then the cartoons, I thought, well, reformations were a really great way of, 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 of working with cartoons because there's such great stuff out there for both the American and the uh, French uh, revolutions. Sorry, I said reformations, revolution. And, and so we talk about, well, what is a cartoon? What's the point of our cartoon? And, and you know, the different terms, caricature, you know, uh, caption stereotyping, these things that are in cartoons that they would need to know about. And so that section of the skills book addresses cartoons. And um, then we move on and we learn about letters. And there's 
fabulous letters out there to do with the uh, 1798 uh, rebellion. And so we've used that to help them learn about letters. But again, it's a very similar style of questions. So after each of these pages that you're seeing here, there's there's the explanation of how to analyze these sources. And so it's the same for uh, letters. And then the census, uh, I thought the census data we have from the famine is really great. And there's a fabulous website designed by University College Cork. And so the students actually get to explore this website. It's a secondary source because all the primary source information has been analysed for them, but it's a great secondary source and technology has helped them access it. So by the time they're halfway through second year, you know, they've learned to analyse pictures, they've learned to analyse maps, cartoons, letters, census. We're really developing that skill set as we go along. And towards the end of second year, biographies, speeches, and an online newspaper archive. And so each of these tasks hopefully will help them with researching their CBA. So, you know, as we go along, we don't want to be driving home the point constantly of assessment for our students because that gets a little overwhelming for them. But they are building their confidence with this. So by the time they are doing a CBA, you know, they have worked with a lot of sources and they've developed the skills necessary to analyze these sources. So it shouldn't be as challenging, hopefully, for them. And um, when we get to third year then, because of, you know, how contemporary the third year course is, there's a lot of great uh, sources online. And so a lot of this is exploring these online repositories. And so they're getting to delve into an archive. It's a digital archive, but they're learning the same skills as they would be if they were elbow deep in dust in the National Archives. And so with third year, we're exploring photography and film as a source of evidence. And, and that's done uh, with the section about World War. And then they're going to explore an online repository that's and that is the documents on Irish foreign policy website, which I'm actually going to talk you through that activity shortly. And then they're going to route through the Kennedy Presidential Library online to try and find information. And it's a very scaffolded task. So it takes them step by step through the Kennedy archive. And then there, the next uh, activity is investigating a repository of historical evidence that is the military archives. So, you know, by the time they're in third year, they've gone through three archives that they could talk about if they wish to. Uh, and finally, um, there's a really great uh, repository of digital recordings on RTE. And so when we get to the section of the course, which covers the role of women in 20th century Ireland and the evolution of the, of, of, of the role of women, there's fabulous interviews and video, video recordings that they can access and explore. So I suppose, hopefully, by the time they've gotten to the end of third year, they're able to talk about a variety of sources. You know, in third year, it's photography, film, but then they're also talking about government records with the documents on Irish foreign policy and able to explore the nuance of, you know, letters that are sent to ambassadors with instructions and then, you know, uh, diplomatic letters to a foreign government, uh, you know, complaining about something. So those types of primary sources are really rich uh, source of learning for them. With the documents in Irish foreign policy, I wanted it to be a fun activity. So I designed it as a scavenger hunt um, or a treasure hunt, for want of a better term. But before that, it explains to them, you know, what are you going to find in the National Archives? And more importantly, what won't you find? Why is there stuff that's not there? You know, it's not a full record of, of the past because things have to be kept away. You know, for example, Something that would be contrary to the public interest cannot be put in a public archive or something that might cause distress or danger to a living person is not going to be there. And, um, you know, so for them to be aware that there is a, a law called the National Archives Act, which says what can and cannot go into this archive, helps frame their understanding of the archive in the first place. This task that we designed is um, talks them through how to access First of all, the online archive, but then it sends them to try and find things. So there's three things. They have to find information or the exact reference number of this uh, file. The Irish government was told by the German government on the 1st of September 1939 to avoid Polish waters and airspace as hostilities expected immediately. So, you know, two days before World War II broke out, the German government gave a warning to the Irish government, don't go near there. Well, 
How do we know this? Find that primary source. And so they have to then figure out how to use the search engine, which is refined by dates, etc. This is a great task to do as a pair activity, particularly if you've got some kids that are less capable online than others. The next one I really like because I'm very fond of uh, Monsignor Hugh O'Flaherty. Um, he was an Irish priest and he organised an unofficial escape network for POWs, Jews and uh, refugees uh, seeking to flee Italy. How do we know this? What evidence is there? Well, there is primary source evidence in the National Archives of the Irish government complaining about him. <laughs> and telling and telling others what he's up to. Um, then Ireland refused to take Jewish refugees at the Evian Conference in July of 1938. How do I know that? Well, there is a document in the Irish Archives that says that. And so this can bring up, you know, historical empathy as well, which is quite a challenging one to, to engage our students with. But that activity in and of itself could take the students about 20 minutes. But at the end of it, they've explored three different types of primary sources online and they've explored a digital archive. So it's a very simple way of scaffolding that learning and making it fun. And um, now that is the end of me. If anything I've said has sparked a question, please put it in the chat box. But I'm handing over now to Mark. Hello, folks, just uh, bear with me for a second. Um, I'll um, just call up this uh, my side of the um, Excellent. Just uh, so I'm going to be looking at um, the key areas uh, of assessment um, uh, in relation to the first section of the uh, strand one, which is like developing historical consciousness. Now uh, I'm mostly going to open up my camera and uh, respond to other things that come up on the screen, but I'll just be with you in just a second. So um, if we to look at those, I'm looking, I suppose, mainly at 1.2, 1.2, 1.3. However, 1.4 is relevant to all of this as well. Um, so uh, that's going to be feeding into this as well. So uh, hopefully you can see that uh, there. Yes, we can, um, Mark. You're good to go. That's great. Thanks, a million. Um, okay, just ask me to start at the bottom again. I'll do that. So um, that's what we're looking at. Uh, 1.3, we're looking in terms of commemoration, 1.1 in terms of empathy, 1.2 uh, in terms of controversy and roots of the modern world. Uh, there is also 1.4 in awareness of historical uh, concepts, but I, I, I think that's kind of um, embedded in a lot of this as well as we move along. Um, and I suppose what I'm looking for is the ways in which the exam uh, and the, the ways in which uh, the students are being assessed uh, overlaps with, with what we see in the uh, textbook as well. Um, I'm going to start off by looking at um, commemoration. So commemoration Commemoration is a central feature to the book. It's important in the NCCA, SEC, and it features in the 2022 exam as well. Um, it looks at the roots of modern issues as well. So, I mean, the, the, the picture that you have there in front of you is of the uh, commemoration around the Reformation. The Reformation is always, uh, I, I mean, I love it actually teaching it, but um, I, students don't always feel it the same way. But I did try and make it a little, we did try and make it a little bit more modern, a little bit more resonant in terms of how we understand it. But I suppose in a broader sense, what we're looking at in terms of commemoration in legacy is an overlap between physical commemoration and the cultural and emotional heft behind that commemoration. So if you just take a look at the screen there, we've got things like the Louvre, we've got things at like the Famine Museum, but we've also got things like the impact of the famine and the impact of commemoration and why that might be important going forward. And we also have things like that, that I, I find personally an astonishing picture of Cole and Mitra holding hands, um, which is, is in commemoration in relation to the European Union. Uh, and I think it's an interesting one because it's the European Union is maybe a slightly dry topic, but I think that photograph and that area of commemoration and how that feeds into the European Union, I think, does make it a little bit more resonant with students and you can understand why that would be considered an important learning outcome for them. Um, so the questions around the uh, SEC and the NCCA um, are asking things like, why is it important to commemorate, et cetera? And I think that's all pretty straightforward. There's plenty of that in the textbook uh, and there's plenty of things to look at there. But there is maybe one thing I would like to uh, highlight in terms of what came up uh, uh, in the paper in 2022. Um, now, we've got a couple of questions there in relation to commemoration from the exam paper, uh, one of which is about you know, why we commemorate a particular figure from the 1960s. But the other one is to do with um, looking at an object and developing uh, and understanding why that object um, uh, is important in relation to the 1960s. Now, if you look over to the other side from the skills book, uh, we have again the idea of a, a 
a commemorative um, sculpture in relation to the Holocaust. So again, you're marrying the idea of physical commemoration with the idea of um, emotional and weighty commemoration. That features throughout the book. And, um, and again, I think that question, uh, you can see there in the skills book, repeating um, Andrew's point as well, that this uh, the skills book is very closely aligned in terms of the questions and in terms of the look uh, of the exam itself. Now, I'm going to try and get through this uh, uh, as quickly as I can uh, for, for, for everyone's benefit. But um, if we move on to empathy, uh, legacy moves between the big historical picture and the more intimate human experience. I suppose one of the ways I was thinking about this was, you know, the the the, the famous figures and maybe the unfamous. I just coined that phrase myself. I'm not sure if it's real, but um, uh, uh, so that's where I think the empathy comes in, um, and it also relates a lot to those longer questions that Andrew was talking about there as well, in terms of understanding things from the point of view of perhaps a more ordinary human experience. If you take a look at that uh, example there from the SEC, uh, from the sample paper, um. I think it's quite interesting the way it's structured because you're given a very broad scope in terms of areas you could look at. It doesn't specify really medieval life as much as anything else those headings there are prompts. But again, it is tending students or uh, encouraging students to look, I suppose, at the more ordinary uh, human uh, experience. Um, I'm going to click on here again to look at another example. This is from the NCCA uh, website, uh, which is the experience of life in a communist country. And on the other side there, you have experience of life in East Germany. Now, nobody likes teaching Stalin more than I do, but uh, uh, you know, this we are trying to look at things from, as I said, the the unfamous, the uncelebrated experience as well. And I think that's where some of this um, uh, historical empathy comes in there again. And again, we can see that in the skills book in relation to the ordinary experience of the uh, 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 Second World War. And we also have, um, again, the experience of the uncelebrated in uh, Margaret Riley there from the 2022 paper, where again, you have elements of the uh, sources that Andrew was talking about but uh, in relation to an ordinary uncelebrated person. Uh, and again, there's a lot of that uh, in the famine section as well, in the uh, textbook uh, uh, as well. Um, and um, sorry, I thought it was something else there, but I think I'll, I'll just crack on. Moving on to controversy. So uh, with controversy, um, this is something that I, I think that it's, it's embraced and examined throughout legacy. It's something that in learning outcomes, I personally really welcome. And I think, I think we all do. It's, really interesting and very important. Uh, as students are given a variety of perspectives and asked to make their own investigations and come to their own conclusions based on historical evidence, based on historical fact. So if you take a look at one there just kind of close to my heart, which is on the um, uh, Irish history story, because I, I remember an argument had many, many years ago. But uh, this is uh, the Irish experience of the First World War. And it's laid out very clearly. And then the think of historically tab, which I'll come back to a bit later on, um, is uh, uh, relevant to, um, to, uh, uh, to that idea of controversy as well. And I'll, I'll come back to that tab a little bit later on. But um, if we look uh, at another example of historic controversy and student engagement, we have there the Cuban Missile Crisis. On the other side, again, you have the thinking historically, which is asking students to engage, asking students to uh, analyze, asking students to make comparisons there. Um, in the middle as well, we also have the Would You Believe tab as well. Now, the Would You Believe uh, uh, section in the book um, uh, is I think is perfectly um, acceptable as a standalone, entertaining, engaging uh, section for its own sake. But I think it also introduces that idea of uh, the randomness in history as well. I mean, that particular example is that that famous example of the uh, uh, submarine, which uh, was very close to launching a nuclear strike during the Cuban Missile Crisis uh, as well. Um, just uh, clicking on there, we have, I, I'm going to talk about Columbus in a second. We have uh, some sources there. Again, this also relates to historical empathy, but it relates to controversy. So Dresden is something that is picked up on uh, 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 regularly in terms of the junior cycle history. But we've also brought in commemoration there as something potentially controversial, because I think that the, the commemoration around Bomber Command is a really um, contentious issue and something that's well worth debating in the class. I personally find it very interesting. Um, but if we just take a look at um, other elements of controversy in the 2022 paper, there is something on Columbus. I mean, in terms of controversy, it's probably the most flagged, most expected area uh, in the um, uh, exam, uh, it's, you know, between the Black Lives Matter protests, um, I think we, it was it was reasonable to expect something on that. And we do have those areas that where, where contention is fairly to be expected, you know, allied behavior during the war, um, the plantations, et cetera. But we also have, I think, some other areas that are maybe 
um, uh, a little bit more uh, uh, fresh uh, to students as well. Things like the controversial legacy of Rome, different perspectives on the Renaissance, that kind of idea. And um, uh, just getting back to the examiner's report, I'm just going to read out what I have here uh, from the examiner's report as well. Um, I'm just going to jump on to one other section there because I wanted to talk about um, controversy as well. The com the Columbus section, I think, is probably one that was kind of flagged. But this one from the 2022 paper, is, it's really interesting. It's Katrina Crow talking about the destruction of the public records in 1922. And she says it's one of the biggest disasters uh, in heritage to happen in any country. It's quite a big statement. And students are asked to engage with that. Now, the Columbus thing you can maybe predict, but it's not going to come up every year. But the Katrina Crow question about that disaster of the public records office is not something that you're easily going to predict in terms of content. But in terms of a, a understanding historical context, in terms of skills, um, that's a question that I think any good student should be able to answer. And the thinking historical, historically uh, sections encourage that kind of thinking over and over again. And that brings us to the examiner's um, advice. So I just read out what we have here. In relation to each learning outcome, teachers should prepare candidates to answer questions that require not only recall of information, but also when required to use higher order skills such as synthesis, analysis, evaluation and comparison. I think that the controversy is the, the issue of controversy is going to drive that forward probably more than any of the other learning outcomes that we have there. And if you're used to debate, if you're used to engagement, if you're used to balancing up ideas, you should be able to tackle a question like that. Um, now, I'm just going to click on, this is my last area to look at, because I'm just, just trying to um, a, 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 a get to the end of the time there. Um, I realize that people have been waiting a while. But um, in terms of roots uh, in the modern world, students are asked to consider how history uh, lives with us in the contemporary world, uh, both in terms of roots of Christmas to modern haircuts to US gun control. Um, and I think that one of the things that we try to do in terms of looking at consequences uh, that Andrew was talking about um, in terms of the um, a, a, in terms of uh, the textbook as well, is the idea that consequences aren't just leading into the next chapter. Consequences are an overreaching umbrella that can be brought from a very early section up to something very modern. I've got something, we've got something in the book about um, Rome and French revolutionary haircuts and the kind of the overlap between that. And uh, one of the ones that I kind of was quite keen on putting in there, for example, is the US Constitution and the uh, 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 contemporary resonances that that has, because I think it's very easy with the uh, War of Independence, and, and I certainly like looking at the, the War of Independence as a war and battles and fellows with red coats and blue coats and tricorn hats. But the revolutionary side of it is the Constitution, and the Constitution uh, lives on to living documents. So students in the textbook get to learn about where gun rights come from. They get to learn about the fact that the gay marriage ruling in America was based on the 14th Amendment from 1868. And, uh, and again, that's the roots of a contemporary world being uh, dealt with in that particular context. Um, uh, we can also see that in a, this uh, a, a question here, or this uh, section here of the uh, a, a paper looking at the uh, various impacts of the Second World War in different parts of the world, maybe moving aside from or away from the Anglo-American experience, which is all very positive and maybe looking at maybe some of the, the, the darker resonances of the Second World War there as well. Uh, and we have plenty of questions like that for causes and consequences of the um, a, a, the revolution. Um, and there's another one I just wanted to flag as well, I suppose, just to underline our thinking in the textbook. I'm not going to say that we were we, we predicted that uh, global warming would come up in the 2022 paper, but it did. Uh, and there is reference to global warming in the uh, textbook as well in terms of the industrial revolution and how the industrial revolution is the beginning of a process of carbon dioxide coming into our atmosphere which has grown since so again the consequences that we look at have a long reach uh, at the end of every chapter and that's something that we factored in there now again going back to the um examiner's advice uh, on that particular one uh, in terms of chronology developing an understanding of chronology through the use of timelines uh, this should help them to see uh, relationships uh, with different uh, between different events and the importance of cause and consequence. Now we have um, timelines at the beginning of every chapter, but um, but the structure of the book and the way we look at these long consequences would allow you to look at overlapping chronologies and overlapping timelines. It's certainly something I enjoy doing in a class. Uh, you know, while one thing is going on somewhere else, 
you know, in a completely different context, something else is going on at roughly the same time. Uh, and that's something that's particularly uh, worth looking at in terms of the early modern period. But also in terms of those standalone chapters that we have uh, on um, uh, industry and on medicine, it's worth comparing those with, say, the famine or, say, the um, the, Irish, uh, the rise of the Irish parliamentary tradition in terms of Parnell or looking ahead to the Second World War and seeing that overlap between um, uh, uh, different chapters of the book in terms of chronology. Uh, and that's something that the book is kind of geared towards as well. Um, so uh, look, I, 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 that's uh, me uh, almost done. We have some of those analytical questions in terms of the uh, developments and measuring what's most significant. And again, uh, looking in terms of chronology should be able to help uh, that in the roots of the modern world. And again, with the skills book, those analytical questions um, come in there in terms of trying to decide what is significant. And the book uh, picks that out and encourages students to think about that uh, as well. But um, uh, so sorry, I might flow through that a little bit, but I'm going to hand back over to Connor now. Thanks a million, folks. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you, Mark, Andrew and Mary Claire. I'm just going to share my screen back again. So for anyone, as I said at the beginning of the presentation, if you have any questions that you'd like to post, you can do it through the chat and the Q&A and I'll get through as many as I can that came came through. I also apologize if you see my cursor floating around. That's because I'm toggling between the two different views to make sure I, I hatch all the questions. So to start with, and I don't know who wants to take this one, I'll leave it to you to fight over. How can we um, differentiate or can, how can we I think it's how can we differentiate for weaker students is the question. I'll take that one if you want. Sure. Guys. Sure. Thank um, you. So yes, this is really challenging when you come to a common level paper. I think that was probably one of the most daunting things for me. You know, the same content being asked the same way for everyone. How are we going to make this easier for students that you know are perhaps less engaged or are more challenged in areas? And so. One of the things we did when we did the teacher book is in every chapter, we devised a way of differentiating the learning for students. And sometimes it was students with, you know, dyslexia. Other times it was students who might have uh, a difficulty accessing this emotionally for autistic students or, um, you know, so there's some suggestions with every chapter as to how to differentiate the content. And in the skills book at the start, um, each of the activities um, is designed to help them organise their thoughts uh, at the start of every chapter. And so that organising your thoughts is really helping those students who might be a little bit weaker draw connections from what they have learned in the past. Uh, so there are some suggestions, but also, you know, in terms of writing, writing accounts, there's structured writing frames in the um, in the teacher book, I'm just opening up there on. Yeah, for so, for example, on the explorations chapter, chapter six, there's a structured writing frame there, you know, helping them develop and plan how to write that so that they're building that skill set as they go along. Uh, it is challenging to differentiate in a common level classroom, but I think a lot of the way of doing this is peer teaching, think, pair, share. That'll help draw them out. Something also that just occurred to me, Mark, when you were talking, when you, when you mentioned the teacher's book, is that the teacher's book has suggested solutions for every question in the textbook and the, the skills book, you know, so being able to show students, you know, effectively, effectively a marking scheme, effectively, you know, these are these are the points that you could say, these are the relevant historical facts uh, for for answering this specific question that's in the textbook or uh, the um, the skills book, I think that can help as well. Um, yeah. You know, because I, I know, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of te textbooks, you know, th there's loads of questions, but they don't actually provide any suggested answers. And it's, it's actually it's also helpful for you as well for teaching. You can you can just photocopy a, a, a page out of the teacher's book and hand it out and get them to do peer 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 or, correction. Or even just project it. You can because you can download yeah. it and um, it's PDF. You can download it, project it on the overhead projector, let them self correct and you go around and double check like. I'm all about minimising the workload for myself. And um, there's also things like vocabulary journals, you know, so you might want to give one of these to the student who's struggling and they don't have to be given to everyone else. So um, they're just some of the things also for kids who don't really have an interest in this. And um, each chapter has a suggested uh, digital 
support system. So, you know, videos that they might find interesting or, you know, ways of hooking them or engaging them with the content. So that's under the integration of digital technologies to support learning. Oh, you can't see because I'm blurring my background. Hey, I'm, I'm hiding the dirt behind me, Connor. Don't say anything. Um, but that, that's in that's in there. So hopefully that will help differentiate for you. Also worth mentioning, I suppose, the digital resources as well in terms of that as well. Great. Um, um, M. Farrell has a question or a point maybe or a quick request for suggestions. I think it is hard to fit six developed points into a longer question, in my opinion. Any suggestions? Is, is this in terms of the space on the uh, provided or hard to come up with six relevant historical facts, is it? Um, Maybe we could ask the poster just to clarify if you wanted to just yeah. put a, another point of clarification clarification into that. We'll, yeah. we'll answer it. it. I don't know what your initial. Yeah, Jen, my, my initial reaction would be like the, the questions, those questions are the account questions. They are the longest questions on the exam. They're worth 18 marks. Um, well, they were last year. That's no guarantee, as I said. It's. I feel like you have to put caveats into uh, everything you say now because they've removed the predictability. But um, you know, they are the longest. Um, they are the, they are the longest essay. They're they're not essays, but they're the longest accounts they're going to write. They are completely shaped by the learning outcomes. So you know, if you think about a learning outcome like, you know, uh, write an account of the causes and or consequences of, um. 1916 you know that because that that effectively you know that that could be an account style question shaped by the 1916 learning outcome i can't remember the exact number it is now in, in strand two um you know they probably should be able to you know that's the kind of they could they could they could write three causes they could write three consequences um and again you know if if you go to to legacy to to our final final page uh, of each chapter we have broken down into kind of causes course consequences or you know for example um when it comes to um you know other chapters it's it's not necessarily cause cause or consequences but it's 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 again shaped by the by the learning outcome itself I'm just trying to pick out an example of one here yeah for example the um the uh Ireland's experience of the war the the learning outcome isn't necessarily you know causes course or consequences um, the, lear the learning outcome is um, to learn about the impact of the Second World War on Irish people north and south uh, and its impact on history and politics on the island. So we, we took those key terms from the learning outcome and we um, scaffolded the kind of summary points. Um, I'm just going to remove I can't remove it, uh, but you can, might be able to see if I put my face in there, you can see we, we basically scaffolded our summary points according to that learning outcome. So again, you know, there's actually quite a lot you could say. I mean, there's definitely six points in it, and, you know. And, and also just to say, it doesn't have to be that detailed. So it could be, you know, Russian books were used in Ireland yeah. during the emergency. You know, that that is a historically relevant fact. And so it... We, we need to even just explaining a, a term and um, so neutrality. Ireland was neutral during the war. This meant that's a historically relevant. They've, they're getting their marks for it. I'm just jumping on the topic that you were suggesting there because I can't think of anyone myself. So yeah. but, you know, we, when we think about getting marks, it, it is actually terms explained, relevant concepts, you know, drawing the really minimize it down to start with and then they can build on it after that it is you're right though it is in the space provided it's challenging but they give that space and it's really useful for us as teachers because the students that aren't writing enough they see right in front of them I haven't written enough the students that waffle have learned to be succinct and that's a really beneficial thing and that'll take them time that could take you know a good two years for them to get their refine their their writing style down but that's one of the reasons we did it in the skills book is to give them the exact space so they get the practice going on that and um, but yeah that's a good question thank you for asking can i just yeah. jump, jump in there on that as well i was going to make that point that, that mary claire was making but uh, you know uh, i think maybe additionally as well uh, th just in terms of the um that medieval question from the sec paper that i i, I had as part of the, the presentation that i gave the, the the parameters of that are very very broad it's not saying write an account of 
uh, a medieval shoemaker in a particular town, a particular place. It's very, very broad. You can write about all of these things. Now, if you look at the end of chapter bullet points on the uh, in, in, in the textbook, there's just way more than six across all of that. Mm -hmm. But the questions seem to be fairly broad. As Andrew was saying, it could be causes and or consequences, which is kind of it allows for quite a lot of information to be used there rather than maybe being um, a, a quite narrow. Again, I suppose we're all concerned about the balance between skills and content and, you know, some of the content can be quite specific, but a lot of those longer questions seem to be allowing a more a, a, a broader interpretation than would have been the case maybe in the old exam as well. Yeah. So so I, I think that would, would, would maybe help address that concern as well. And just to clarify, in case you guys hadn't seen it, it was a, it's an issue of the space that's given and how to fit it mm. within that space on the exam paper. Sticking yeah, with the, like what Mary Claire said there, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, sticking to the exam, actually, any advice on how to help students manage their time during the exam? Again, it's it's I found my my own students getting them used to that kind of I suppose hidden substructure of most source questions. You know, the category one style question, information retrieval. It's just a date. It's just a word. You know, my students used to kind of they, they'd be they, they they're trying to they're like a greyhound out of the traps they're they're trying to you know they're full of energy at the beginning and the first question they were writing big long sentences they're trying to jam in every little fact that they know about it but like that's a waste of their time that's a waste, a waste of their energy so you know if they recognize that okay the that type of question there's not much space it's a fairly straightforward information retrieval question one word you know um the second type of question category two question they're often slightly tricky it might say you know three elements of renaissance painting in painting two make sure that they read the question carefully and then once they've done that that's the most time that they're going to spend you know apart from that it's fairly straightforward again no background you know keep your sentences short you don't have to write big long sentences just even if the information if you give the information that's all they need um and then you know spend the time on those accounts um you know that's that's where your what that's where your energy and that's where your your um most of the marks are for each of the questions so you know spend time on them and so getting them used to that kind of structure can help them negotiate their own time um you know i was very worried about time going into the last summer's exam because the sec sample paper you know was a 10 question sample paper it turned out that you know it was only eight questions and so my own students um, and they didn't to struggle there, too too much with the eight questions in two hours yeah there's no guarantee about the length of the paper you know the, exactly the, yeah when, when we asked they didn't commit to the fact that it was going to be an eight question paper going forward and um, and going forward i don't anticipate them putting the marks on the paper either so you know i suppose getting our students used to just working with the space that's provided that is the only indication they're going to have of how much content they should be putting down and um, but you know practicing like like andrew said there practicing being efficient <laughs> Um, with their time is is really the only thing we can help them with at this point. Yeah, I think because that's uh, in terms of in terms of going through um, um, tests at the moment. I mean, that's that's kind of a big challenge as well. Is that you know, it's the, the, the telling the good students it's exactly as Andrew said, they don't need to be writing, uh, you know, huge amounts. But uh, that practice, I think, is crucial. Yeah, I'm not sure whether you guys are looking at the Q and A, but you did preempt another question where someone was asking. It's actually the same person who asked um, about the, the space uh, in the exam paper and how easy or difficult it is to fit everything in. Is the exam more likely to be eight questions rather than 10? We don't know, right? We don't, yeah, they, that's unfortunately, the, they, they know. And they won't they're going to keep us guessing. They might change it up on purpose. You know, they probably they probably will, you know, just to keep well, people I, guessing. I, I got the feeling, that I, have no, I have no special insight on this, but I got the feeling that the eight questions was maybe a, a conservative COVID induced, uh, uh, but I, I, would I kind of would anticipate that's the lower end of what they're going to do, but you know, that's a small kind of. What remains feeling, to be seen. You know? Yeah. 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 Just and that's, across, that's across the board as well. You know, every subject they're, they're, they're removing yeah. the predictability in the exam, so. Okay. Um, conscious of time, but I'll try to get through one or two more. The next question up, the language difficulty level seemed a bit tricky in the 2022 paper in places. Do the guys have any tips on building vocabulary and I guess in terms of exam readiness and having the language of the exam and preparing students along those lines? 
what I advice might you have around that? That's a really that? good question. I, I can't see the Q&A, so I can't see who asked it, but it's a really good question. It was one of the concerns, um, you know, with the new specification, the language. And really, the only thing is building on it constantly and using the terms from the learning outcomes as we teach the topics, you know, that it's it's no longer a case of doing a class on terminology at the start. As we go along, we constantly have to integrate those terms and build on their on their vocabulary and um, because they are, you know, I think people thought common level exam, common level course, it's not going to be challenging. That's not the case. They are going to use terms and they're expecting the students to, to know them. So um, it's really just practice and integrating them into our teaching, you know, and um, what, what is another word for for consequence? You know, and getting the students to think that through legacy, <laughs> you know, like uh, uh, lots as many ways as possible of, of getting them to think about this as we're doing it. It, it is yeah. a challenge. Particularly a, practical, students. A, a practical tip that I picked up on and it's from from a, a, an exercise in, in the skills book, actually. And it was oh. new to me. Mary Claire wrote it and I now use it in my own English class all the time. I think it's brilliant uh, is to when you have a new term. I get them to go to the back of their copy books. I get them to write it down, but it's not just I used to what I used to do is just write down the term, write down an explanation that's very dry and, and you know, they invariably never remember uh, the, the complicated vocabulary. So so it's just a simple case of, you know, write, write down a definition, write down a synonym, write down an antonym, uh, put it in a sentence and then draw a picture of it, which is often quite, quite fun, particularly if it's like an abstract word or abstract idea sometimes, you know, and they, they, that it really does help and it really sticks. So that's just one little teaching tip. You know, that's something they, they all have sections out at the back of their copy book where they, they have a list of words and they do that exercise. So they, they now, they now know what, what to do when every time we have a new word. So, yeah. Oh, good. I'm glad you found it useful. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, it's useful. It's been very useful for me in English. Yeah. Right. Um, I'm conscious of time, but I it's not, not so much a question. Just I know, Andrew, you mentioned the Chief Examiner's report, which was only published very recently. Were there any headline items from that or what did you take from that? I know you did discuss it and you provided some examples of, of statements from it, but anything in particular that you learned from that and perhaps what advice you might give to teachers based on that and if they haven't seen the report itself? Um, I know Mary Claire looked at it in, in, in some detail. When I say Chief Examiner's report, <laughs> that's probably the wrong. That's the wrong. I'm just that's that's what that's what we they that's what we generally say at the end of, of it. All of the exams. Okay. Just yeah. Put it out yeah. There. My, so that's my fault subject, then. Yeah. 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 Every yeah. subject because this is the last summer was the first time the entire new junior cycle was was uh, actually assessed, and so they promised that they would do a review of it, and so each subject is reviewed, and they commented on things that you know, the students did really well in it and then things that the students needed to incorporate going forward. And through our presentation, we actually incorporated all the advice that they came up with for history, because a lot of it was actually syncing with what we were doing and um, uh, with legacy. So, you know, um, but it's available. Uh, it's a little tricky to find, but it is available. If you have other subjects you want advice in, you can read them there. There are like two and a half pages for each subject. Um, but essentially what they were saying with the history course is students needed more exposure to sources. That was the biggest thing that they needed to be able to analyze pictures and cartoons and photographs and letters and all of that so that they needed more practice with it. That was the yeah. biggest piece the, we talked about. The other one or two things that stood out to me were there was, there was it mentioned that, you know, make sure students read the question carefully and build the practice of underlining the keywords of a question, you know, which is kind of simple, simple mm -hmm. exam practice. Um, yeah. And and also the, the one that jumped out at me as well is that they're familiar with the key terms of the learning outcomes, things like, you know, um, cause and consequences um, parliamentary tradition. Uh, international tradition was a big one. That, yeah, you know, the, international the cooperation. Yeah. What does that mean? What is cultural nationalism? You know, the students actually need to be able to define it because that's mm -hmm. in the learning outcomes. So, you know, those things would be worth taking. And like yeah. the other junior cycle stuff as well, it's it's about it's about skills over over content, which is a little bit uh, not over content, but like skills emphasize, you know, more sort of maybe the content. And I think that can be yeah. tricky in a history classroom. You know, it, it's it's, it's, it's bad in English, but it's tough in history. It's very tough in history. I'm struggling to complete. You know, I'm, I've struggled every time to try and get through the the, the course because we, we're trying to practice the skills. Um, but you have to do the content in history. You know, you really have to cover the content or else they can't access the, the, the sources, you know. Andrew, there's um, a very good scheme of work which tells you when to cover things in the teacher book. <laughs> Go take a look at it. <laughs> <laughs>
Absolutely. We'll encourage you to take a look. Go on to fallen.ie, take a look at what we've produced at Legacy. Lots of great, great resources there. Um, I see just one question has popped in before I segue to the conclusion. Um, just well, I suppose it, it's appropriate actually because it's a message of thanks from a teacher just to say many thanks for an excellent webinar and legacy is excellent. Your information has been very helpful advice as we prepare third years for June. Many thanks again. So lots of thanks coming through and it's probably appropriate then that we wrap things up. I know we ran a little bit over, but I think it was time very well spent. So once again, to begin with, just to thank um, Marie Claire, Andrew and Mark for such an informative presentation. Um, you cut through a lot of, I was, as you were going through, my reaction was that you were covering a lot of bases there because this, as you say, skills, historical skills, and probably part of that is developing historical empathy and the research piece as well, and, and assessment, obviously looking at the exam and what is this all leading towards if, if that's the way you view assessment and certainly it's it's a critical piece for teachers they want to make sure that they and their students are exam ready by the time they reach third year and i think you've given a really good overview of, of that and how legacy um, fulfills that objective so from from behalf of, of me and everyone out there i'm sure a big thanks to you Secondly, I'd just like to thank all the teachers out there who've joined us on this webinar. I know particularly how busy a time it is. It's always busy. So to give up a little bit more time than we planned for um, means a lot. Um, but again, I, I think it's time that was very well spent and that you get gleaned a lot from the presentations themselves. Um, there's lots of, if you have any other further questions, please feel free to get it in, in touch. You can obviously do that through Follins.ie or looking to speak to your rep if you want to search. And um, I think th that's pretty much it. Um, the presentation is has been recorded, so anyone who's registered will get a copy of that or get a link to that tomorrow. And there's also, I think, if you need a certification of attendance, we can provide evidence that you've been here, that you've attended. That's another thing that we can do. But I think that's it. Um, so from all of us in the Follins virtual world on this side, uh, just to thank everyone out there for attending. Thanks very much for your time again, and I hope you have a lovely rest of your evening. Bye now.